Best welcome back we could have ever asked for. What's happening? Chaos. Happy Father's Day. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles live. What's up? Everybody around the world. I missed you. I miss my family. What's up, Joe Frank? Hope you're well, buddy. What's up, Ryan? What's up, Paulie? What's up, D? Come on now. Let's get it. I got a good feeling about today's show. I do. I got a good feeling about this. Yeah. You know, funny you should say, you know, we have my dad on in the, in, in, in the, we were in the tailgate, we were tailgating and I had my dad on for a while. We were, we were talking about, what is it? The U S opens going on. So he's like, I got to go watch the U S open. So what's up, Larry Kelly. What's happening, brother. Hi, Lynette. What's happening doll. All right. All right. Yo, my Scully game is on point because it's minus 25 degrees below zero in my apartment right now with this new air conditioner I got, you know? So, so there you go. It's all good. I hope everybody's well. The world is coming back online. There's lots of exciting things happening. I hope things are good in your well, in your world. What's up, Jacob? What's up, Yuri? What's happening? What's up? You know? Shout out to Arnie. I got the U.S. Open on mute. I know, I know. I'll try to get him back on during the show. I'll call him. Yo, Jason Kreekampf, what's happening, bro? Yeah, it was great to be back at the A7 the other day, and thank you for the record. I'm going to give it to my drummer, who's a big collector, and who was begging me to get him the record. So, what's up, Jason Kreekampf? Hope you're well. That said, let's get it rolling. I don't got a lot to say other than happy Father's Day, everybody, to all the fathers out there. It is Shout Out Sunday. Let's do a lot of shouting out. Let's have a good time today, man. Let, let's, let's talk about the, the tie that binds us together, music. That said, let's bring on the hardcore show to fuck. What's up? What are you eating, bro? What That's are you eating? Richard. I hope you brought enough for everybody in the class. <laughs> I got them in the coffin. Look, I keep them in the coffin here. What is that? My Jolly Ranchers. Oh, jeez. <laughs> What's God. the matter? You don't like Jolly Ranchers? What's wrong with you? It's it's not American <laughs> to not like Jolly Jolly Ranch. God. So, I think I ate enough Jolly Ranchers as a kid, like to the point where your mouth is like stained. <laughs> like I still have that sour taste in my mouth, you know. God. The uh, so uh. so you're not you're not seeing uh, your son for Father's Day, huh? Uh, he's down with his. He's down in Florida. Ah, I talked to him. He's down in Florida. He's he twenty-one, bro. Bro, he's twenty-one. My kid's twenty-one now. He's he's got like he got. He runs around with his girlfriend. He's like he's too cool now to hang out with me. You know. Uh. Oh, you know, man. kids are funny. They come back like they cycle in and out. Like first I'm cool, then I'm not cool, then I'm cool, then I'm not cool. You know. <laughs> Whatever, man. Oh, I'm not man. cool, right? I'm nah, not we, cool. We like I'll never be cool. <laughs> Fuck do I care about being cool? Oh uh, man, great, great seeing everybody yesterday, by the way, at the uh, Generation Records. That was awesome. Oh, I got I got a wait, I got a picture. I got a picture of that that you took yesterday. Hold <laughs> on. Here you go. Here's a picture of you, me, and the crew from you, me, and the crew from yesterday, right? Boom. Ah, there we are. <laughs> yep. That's the crew. That purple shirt is jumping. Look at that. Yeah, rap was, Yep. I look like um. I look like um. I look like all the blood is drained out of my body. I look like I've been dead a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because my my giant head is blocking the sunlight from reaching. Listen, you. the moral of the story is: people say, "Wow, you look amazing." Like, how do you do it? I'll tell you how I do it. Stay the fuck out of the sun. <laughs> that's, that's how true. I do it. You know, oh, man, I'm happy. We've got I a new band. <laughs> oh yeah, we were just talking about that. We were just talking about it. <laughs> this is the new lineup for the gluten free motherfuckers. <laughs> that's our new band. We are the gluten free motherfuckers. Yep. Oh, that's hysterical. That GFMF. <laughs> All the blood is drained from my body. Oh man. All right, let's do photo of the let's day. Let's do huh? photo of the day. Yeah, let's get let's, let's Ladies do it. Ladies and gentlemen. 
boys and girls of all ages, clock socks, bagels, and locks, Chank, clank your chains and count your change. This is photo of the day. Wrong answers only, please. There you go. Photo of the day. What do we got here? Photo of the day. Hmm. Let's see. What do we got? Come on. Jump in the fire, kids. Jump in the fire. Jump in the fire. Is it Venom? That's kind of, I could see that. Like the dude, no, not Venom. What's the other one uh, that we had when Johnny Z was talking about? Demolition Man. What band is that? That's Ve that's uh, Venom Inc. Uh, Venom Inc. Right. Yeah. Is it Billy Idol? The is it is it Billy Idol the Metal Years? <laughs> is it Dolly Parton Metal Set? Is it Phil Collins? <laughs> is it Quiet Riot? Is it Fleetwood Mac? All right, come on, Quiet Riot. Quiet Riot. Is it White Lion? What was White Lion's song? That really fuck. Oh God. Wait. What was that? Wait. No. I think it was called. Wait. Or wasn't it? When the children oh, cry. Yeah. Yes, like, it was. Oh, when God. the children cry. <laughs> like wasn't that some White Lion shit? Right. Yeah. That that guitar player. That guitar player from White Lion. What was his name? Vito Brada. Yeah, he looked like a poor man's Van Halen. Yo, he like disappeared off the face of the earth. He like drives a cab in Staten Island now. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, like he's like one they of had, those, like, what happened to Vito Brada? They had their know? moment. When the children cry. Ah! <laughs> Jesus. Is it Judas Priest? Is it Doro? Hmm. Is it De La Style? I don't know what De La... Is it Blondie? Is it Versace? Oh, is it... Is it the Foo Fighters at MSG? That's tonight, actually. Yo, check this out. You ready? Yo, fuck the Foo Fighters. <laughs> How's that sound, bro? How's that ring your bell? One more wow. time for everybody out there. Yo, fuck the Foo Fighters. Wow. I can't, yo, that drummer makes me... I'm sorry, bro. I know we got a drummer on the show today, but that drummer, man, irritates the shit out of me in that band. I'm sure he's a good <laughs> dude and everything. But, yo, fuck that dude. Too smiley? <laughs> oh, God. All right. Foo you. Wow. A foo? A tr are you a true, a true foo schnicken? How's that? God. Yeah, I'm coming in hard today. I know. I'm going to rip on some drummers today. That's it. We haven't even I'm gotten gonna rip to on some drummers, man. We haven't even gotten to Billy Joel yet. All right. Right answers <laughs> only. What do we got here? Who is this? What's go? Looks like they're having a good time, that's for sure. Yep. All right, let's see. What do we got? Taylor Hawkins. That's who that is. Taylor Hawkins. Ooh. Watch, I'm gonna hear from I'm gonna hear from like <laughs> I'll hear from him tonight. <laughs> Bro, why do you hate me? Dave Grohl right. is just about to come on the show. Hey, you guys, hey Drew, you want to come down to the garden tonight? Put you on the list. <laughs> you know what? No, I don't. You know what? No, thank you. I don't want to go see the Foo Fighters at the garden. I'd rather sit here by myself in my apartment. <laughs> by myself. <laughs> All by myself. <laughs> sit home and rot. <laughs> sit home and rot. Girls, girls, they're okay. All right, here we go. Yo, Drew. Yo, Drew. Do you who do you hate more, Phil Collins or the Foo Fighters? Phil Collins. There you go. <laughs> How's that for an answer? <laughs> All right. Is it D. Schneider? Is it D. Schneider? Is it Twisted Friggin' Sister? Is it Twisted Sister? The Senior Years. Is it D. Schneider? Is it C. Schneider? Is it <laughs> Twisted Fucking Sister? What is it? It is D. Snyder. And actually, the crazy thing is this picture was only uh, a week ago. A week ago? I took this uh, last Friday 
Uh, D did a, he, they filmed the show for a new video. He played at a place called the Stereo Garden in Patchogue, Long Island, because uh, he has a new, a new solo album coming out. And in fact, this second solo album, masterminded by Mr. Josta. That's Jamie, right. Jamie, who actually wrote and I believe produced uh, most of the stuff on this album and the previous album as well. So there's a tie-in with our guest today. Absolutely. And it's it's definitely a much heavier D. Snyder than the Twisted Sister stuff. And, um, and you can definitely hear in some of the songs, you could tell like a Jamie Josta chorus when it comes, you know, and... Uh, but I got to tell you something. I mean, I grew up a Twisted Sister fan. And in fact, Mark Mendoza came out and played a couple of songs. Well, you're a Long them. Island guy, right? I am a Long Island guy. And, That's and, right. And, and Twisted Sister's a Long Island band. Oh, yeah. They're, they're in like the, probably the Mount Rushmore of Long Island bands, you know? And, yep. uh, but he is 66 years old. And he played for nearly two hours, tore the place up. And like, you know... He still plays like he did in, you know, in the 80s. I mean, the guy's in great shape. And, uh, you know, it, it, they really only, they only did like three or four Twisted songs. And they did all the new stuff he was showcasing. In fact, most of the record, no one's even heard yet. And it sounded good, you know. And uh, You know what? Let, let, let me balance this thing out a little bit. You ready? I'm ready. D. D Schneider. Good dude. Good dude right there. <laughs> Love that guy. Great guy. I, I bumped into him many times, including on the subway in New York City. Nice guy. Always has time for people. Good dude right there. D. Schneider. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? He re and he's he's in touch with like a lot of the modern, you know, the the heavy music. And uh, he said his I think his daughter and his son are the ones that like. They, like he'll be like, what should I be listening to? And you know, his son Jesse was actually a an MTV VJ for a while towards the end. Is that right? And Jesse, yeah, Jesse. I believe he, he went under the name Jesse Blaze. Jesse Schneider. Listen, and, if you uh, got a name like Jesse, listen, you got yeah. a name like Jesse Schneider, you might want to change it to Jesse <laughs> Blades, right? That's like you know, Jesse Jesse Bernstein or but, Goldman or Schwartz. You might want to change it if you're going to get into the, if you're going to do something in the music business, you know, but, uh, but he was from, good. Listen, man. And he, I could say that cause I'm Jewish, right? <laughs> from one heap, from one heap to all you other heaps <laughs> out there that are trying to break into the music business. You know, you think stone is my family name given family name. No. In it's fact, Schwartz, uh, it's Schwartzowitz. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Actually, the funny thing, speaking speaking of Jewish May musicians. May the Schwartz be with you. Speaking of Jewish musicians, the I want same, you to comb the desert. The same night that D. Snyder played Patchog, Kiss actually played the Little Island in New York City. That's right. Yeah, so it was a busy. It was a, you know what? The fact is, bands are back. You know, and don't be scared. Come, come back, people. Come back. Come All right, bro. I got, I got. I got to bring that lunatic on. Yes, I'm gonna go. Uh, I'll, run I'll, off to I'll, my sisters. You'll come back, back on later. The end. You got it. Okay. All right. Bye. Yo, what's happening? This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live, and we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, the Organic Grill, the Texas Silver Rush, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Chacho's Tacos, Generation Records, and. Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, located in Lakewood, Colorado, is the Rocky Mountain headquarters for all things punk, hardcore, and metal. Established in 2014, they have the largest selection of records, CDs, shirts, stickers, patches, and accessories between Chicago and Los Angeles. From the pit to the ditch, they've got your back. Get in touch with them at www.chainreactionrecords.com. Also, Chacho's Tacos, located in Corpus Christi, Texas. Chacho's Tacos opened the doors in 2001. Home of the almighty Chacho's Taco. They cook up an incredible homestyle Tex-Mex food. And this month, they are celebrating their 20th anniversary. They've been supporting underground music since the beginning. And in their own words, we ain't stopping anytime soon. Touring bands that play Corpus Christi. And this means you. Even if your band sucks 
and you're packed in that stinking van with a bunch of dudes you hate, stop by and get some tacos. Touring vans that play Corpus Christi, swing by and get a home-cooked meal at Chacho's Tacos. The underground scene will never die. Please follow us on Facebook or on Instagram. One last one. How about our buddies at Generation Records? Since 1992, Generation Records has been a mainstay of the New York metropolitan area music scene. Hey, man, are you going to make the scene? Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip-hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues, soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as T-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. Yo, I got my Frank Zappa shirt at Generation Records yesterday. They buy used record collections and music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area. Call or email generationrecords at gmail.com and follow them on Facebook and Instagram. That said, you asked for it, you got it! Happy Father's Day, brah. Hey, happy Father's Day to you as well, Drew, and all the fathers out there, all the single dads, all the dads, man. Yeah, man. Holding it down for our kids. We love our kids. Listen, bro, you're, you're a good dad. I've seen you with your kid, man. And, and having a kid has sort of changed you. You turn your life around a little bit, too. It really uh, put the last peg in there. Yeah, it really got me straight now, man. But, you know, he don't feel like coming on today. He's over here. He's going to be quiet. He's on his Xbox. Okay. But he's having a great day. And I really uh, thank you for letting me get on a Sunday. I love Matt Byrne. He's an awesome drummer. Incredible show today. I can already. I have a great feeling about today's show, too, man. I mean, come on. It's I a do. Trainer. So, hey, uh, so look, yo, you, you, you. Let's talk about this. What's going on with this? All right, look, I, I, I was going to build up to that, but we'll work it down now because I, I was in the flea market yesterday. Sometimes lightning strikes right next to you when you're in like the collector game. So I'm in the flea market and I find like three big bags of all these, uh, you know, army toys. So I'm like, all right, they're pretty cool. Uh, I'm going to show a couple of the ones, not the guns in that world really quick. Like this really cool buddy L this is, this is like three huge boxes of loose army guys, you know, with, you know, these are like the gems I pulled out. Nice little buddy L you know, they were like half plastic, half metal. Let's see, it says uh, Buddy L down there. Yeah, see the Buddy L? Yeah, these are always cool, little jammies. And then uh, what I thought was really cool, the reason I bought the whole box is because it had, uh, I don't know, a lot of the younger kids, you know, 30-year-old dudes. These came out in the 80s. G.I. Joe, you know, scaled down because Star Wars was doing so well in the toy game. So G.I. Joe was too big, and it was like, you know, it was cha times were changing. And uh, so they came back with all these badass vehicles, and I got a bunch of those in there. Definitely cool pieces right there. And then to keep going here, we're going to keep it rolling. Now we're moving on to the other weird thing I found. Oh, uh, look, let's show this cool Jeep, too. G.I. Joe Jeep. This is the vamp. You know, this is the thing. When you buy stuff, though, and uh, at the flea market, we're kind of we're kind of missing something, you know? <laughs> Still a cool piece. This turns into, like, say, a display, a shelf piece. You know, I got the one back tire. But uh, then moving right on, those were really cool. But when you find the little bric-a-brac stuff, it's fun, you know? But... Back in the day, when you'd read comic books, they'd have these ads for, you know, get a whole battle set with 200 soldiers, you know. And then uh, you'd get the soldiers, and they'd be these little, these little tiny-ass guys, man. They're just little. Look, oh, like look what I picked up. I wanted to pick that up, and I did. Hey, I, I knew what that is. That that's, is? Uh, I knew what that was. What you know you what put that is? Candyland? No, no, that's. No. no um, See who can get it. Definitely. Get, I know it's right there, man. Ah, yeah. oh. we all played this one as kids, you know. Yeah. So yeah, those are cool. It was the car from Life. Oh, Life. Yeah. Right. Yo, yo, Larry the Hunter got it. Yeah. First. 
Oh no, so, David, uh, David, get the funk out of my face. Got it. Life. Nice. So David also life. in there, now we'll get to the guns and Navarone stuff. Also in there was a bunch of parts. You know, that's what, it, you know, after I went through everything, it's like, now I want to go hawk this guy because the instructions for the guns of Navarone were in there. And some of the, uh, some of the guys, you know, it was the Germans versus the U S and also there was a, a motion picture of the guns of Navarone with of course, uh, bro. Gregory Peck, David Nivens and, uh, uh, what's the, the great guy? Shaw. uh, what's the great guy? Anthony Quinn. Oh, I think Robert so, Shaw was in the, in the sequel force 10 from Navarone. Right, right. So I'll show a couple. Th this is one of the cooler figures from that set. The guy with the binoculars by the cannon. Now, is this, is this, this, this looks to me like this is like, is this, would you consider this like a holy grail of toy collectors? Absolutely a grail piece for people who collect marks. But you know what's funny? On the directions, I noticed it says another big company that I love. It says on the uh, instructions here, Mego, 1980. So I don't understand. I'm going to have to research the Marks connection. And this also says Navarone playset, but it's right there too. So maybe it was like a cross, you know, you know, the, the, the Marks company did it through Mego. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I want to show, before we go, another really rare one that was in the box. And also, I'll show the parts from the Navarone really quick. Well, what's this? The Wait, hold on. What, what's going on here? No. What's going on here? Well, you know, Father's Day weekend. I had to get outside just to, Me and Luke played this outside while it was raining. And I kept <laughs> saying, you want to go in? And he was like, no, nah, that's cool. We, it keeps coming and going. I was like, well, yeah, if you were a soldier at war, you'd have to go through the weather and everything, right? So we learned a life lesson. But the coolest thing that I found in that bin, and like I said, strike, I almost got the Guns of Navarone playset. But the coolest little smalls I got, like, you know, it came with, this is how you could tell a toy line. If the toy, you see that, and it's that yellow plastic, I know that all these pieces came from the Guns of Navarone, the rifle rack, you know, pretty cool. The rifle rack, couple tables. So, so, so what, 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 like the shit's in a box at the flea market and you like pick through it and you're like, yo, I know what this I, is. I, I just saw the GI Joe stuff and I offered the guy 40 bucks for all three boxes. And he just said, no problem. And this is another cool little piece. This was the, this in the Guns of Navarone. I remember stupid shit like this. This was the weights that held the elevator. Oh, That's yeah, sure. Put sure. the elevator down. And the other, yeah. I mean, smalls are cool, this kind of stuff, because it's so small. You know what got lost. But I think these are really cool and rare, too. These little tiny binoculars for the guy, you know? Mm -hmm. So to find the little smalls like that, and I'm going to do... Real quick, we all know, know the only good Nazi is a dead Nazi. We got some kid painted this one up, the dead guy on the ground. <laughs> Pretty tough. <laughs> but I just want to, before I go, these were some of my favorite Marks guys. And let's see if you guys agree. Hey, Paulie Porkchop says, per Google, Mego acquired the Marks molds in 1980. Okay, okay. So there you go. So I'm going to give you... Five of my favorite all-time green soldier guys really quick. Come on, let's There's go. This guy, let's look, this, this guy, remember him getting shot? Oh, that's fucked up. That's a good like, one. Uh, this here, guy throwing you, you the put grenade. Him up, you put him up and I'll do the pose. Yeah, this guy doing the grenade was always a good one. Yep. This guy, come on, fellas, right? The sergeant. Come on, let's go. And then these were my all-time two favorite guys. I'm just going to do them together. The karate guy and the guy with the knife. I just love them. You know, like. I like, I like, I like he's like this. He's like. Could be moshing, you know. Yeah, it's like. Could have been like moshing to the underbrush. So yeah, that was my big score, guys. 
this weekend. Right on, brother. Uh, you know, it was just cool. For Father's Day, I found something, and I got down on the ground and played with my kid all night. We played for about – we didn't come in until like 9 o'clock. So, you know, we had a good time yesterday, and today we're chilling, and then tomorrow we're going to the beach. We're going to do Father's Day part one and part two. Good man. All right, brother. And, guys, have a great show, man. Thanks. Thank you. You're going to come back on later and say hi to our guest? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Love Matt. We'll talk to you later. All right, guys. Bye. Oops. Rat phone! Rat phone! Rat phone! Rat phone! Rat phone! Rat phone! It's just that kind of a show, isn't it? Something in the air. Mercury in retrograde is going to be ending tomorrow, by the way. So everybody's going to be, everything's going to be all right, people. Fear not. That said, let's bring on today's guest. Let's bring it on. Today's guest is a drummer hailing from the Queen City on the Hudson, Poughkeepsie, New York. He's known for his work with the bands All Out War, Albino Love Slaves, and of course, for the past 20 years in eight studio albums, the almighty Grammy-nominated hate breed. Please welcome, coming at us, from lovely Wappingers Falls in upstate New York, the hard hitting, the big thumper. I know he likes that, Mr. Matt Byrne. <laughs> the big thumper. <laughs> big, he's a big thumper, this kid. Thanks for having me. Happy Father's Day. Listen, I can only hang for like five minutes because I just got two tickets to Foo Fighters. And <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> oh, oh man, I, I know. I know in the position you're in, you, you know. You have to like everybody, you know, so, <laughs> so don't, don't worry. Don't worry. You know, oh, it's great. Thanks for I, having me. My pleasure, man. Let's have some fun. Awesome. Um, I also want to say, you know, today is my uh, parents' anniversary. So it's Father's Day, parents' anniversary, 51 years they've wow. been married. Still going strong. And after me and my sister, that's no small feat. So happy anniversary to my parents, the Burnses. And just just a side note, your sister Jennifer is is a theater actress. She was in Evil Dead, et cetera, right? Yes, she is. Yeah, she's a she's a theater actress. Does off Broadway stuff, a lot of traveling stuff. And uh, late two thousands, two thousand seven, eight, somewhere around there, uh, she did Evil Dead the musical, right in New York City. And uh, they had an opportunity to go on. I think it was The View at the time. Whichever one Rosie O'Donnell was on. I remember Rosie O'Donnell. She brought him right. on. She was big into theater. And they did one of the numbers and everything like that. It was great. Uh, really great makeup. And uh, she was, they, they did a soundtrack for the show too, as they do with a lot of Broadway shows. Sure. So you can find it online and in the, in the stores, wherever they still sell CDs or whatever. And uh, she's on this the original soundtrack too. So obviously you come from, you come from an artistic family. Uh you know, between you and your sister, paint the picture growing up. Um, was there music in your household? Uh, how and where did you grow up? Well, it's funny you say that. Um, my grandparents, I grew up here in uh, Poughkeepsie, Wappingers area. Um, I bounced around. I lived in, in uh, other places in this area, you know, living here. I lived in Beacon for a while. I lived in Poughkeepsie, the city of Poughkeepsie. I just moved from Poughkeepsie back to Wappingers, grew up in Wappingers, and I lived up in Highland for a while. So I've been all over the place around here. But uh, my family's originally from Rye, New York, Port oh, Chester, wow. New York, of course. that area. And my grandparents on my father's side, they were in vaudeville way, way, way back. For anyone who doesn't know what vaudeville is, uh, think the Honeymooners, you know, Abbott and Costello, sure. uh, that type of stuff. And that's how my grandparents actually met. They were both in two different traveling families in vaudeville, and they met on the road. And uh, when they were in the early 20s, they decided to retire from that and get married and start a family and everything. And here we are. And then uh, so so they each family made a lot of connections. I remember my grandmother had stories about, you know, they were she was out with Abbott and Costello on their traveling. You know, this is before TV. Of this is when, you know, you were on a touring circuit like us bands do now, booking agents and all this stuff. And they were out usually uh, there were some clubs involved, but it was a lot of hotels, too. So you'd post up at a hotel. Well, vaudeville, a vaudeville, vaudeville was incredible. You'd have a comedian and then you'd have a magician and yeah, then yeah. you'd have you'd have a little dance thing. And then, yeah. and then you know, it was like it was a whole vaudeville show and, and it was a traveling uh, sort of troupe. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of families uh, from what yeah. I've heard about and what I've seen, 
it was like a family thing. And these families sure. would travel around. And, you know, my grandfather's family, there was four of them. My grandfather was the youngest. And, um, you know, my great grandfather, he did the rings. So like, you know, we have his rings, like, you know, rings it takes all this upper body strength to like circus acrobatic stuff. And they were all singers and dancers. My grandmother, same thing. She was a dancer. Her brother was the music guy. So, um, yeah, she, she used to tell stories about how she was out with Abbott and Costello and they were posted up at this hotel and, uh, Lou Costello, you know, he was famous for his spaghetti and meatballs. So he'd have everyone back up to his room. So it was like, you had spaghetti and meatballs with Abbott and Costello. Wow. And, uh, my, on my grandfather's side, they had a relationship with Bob Hope back in the day. So, um, they did a lot of stuff with him. And I think my aunt has the show flyer. They used to have a lot of show flyers. The reason why they don't have a lot of the stuff from back in the day is another story that I have to tell, but they have some things and uh, a show flyer where, you know, they were billed. My, my grandfather's family was a headlining act. They were called the Sylvester family and they were billed over Bob Hope. So oh, wow. they um, created a, a relationship. And for years later, you know, they still had somewhat of a relationship. I think my aunt has Christmas cards that he sent them. You know, so that's so where it started. A, Audville. So, so as a young kid, as a real young kid, I, I'm, I'm assuming uh, you guys watched your family watched movies together and, 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 and music. And it was just a, an artistically inclined family. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It actually was, you know, it wasn't, uh, my grandfather had a ukulele and it wasn't strange for Christmas time to roll around and everyone's over and he just, you know, does a little tune or something like that. That's and, uh, cool. You know, always hamming it up. He had the penguin from Batman in the fifties show. He had that voice down. Burgess Meredith. He Burgess Meredith, man. Mickey from Rocky. Right? Yes, Mickey from Rocky. Yeah. So uh, yeah, there was a lot of cool stories of that. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of, you know, until they were in their twenties, I roughly, then they got off the road, got married. And then years later, um, if you're familiar with Rye Playland, a little of amusement, course, bro. Of a course. lot of people, you know, you truck up from the city or whatever. So of in the sixties, he owned the fun house in Playland. What? Yeah, he owned the fun house. So it's funny, you know, growing up. I mean, we're talking Rye Playland, the Dragon Coaster, the might, the, the the Mighty Mouse. Yeah, the you Mighty know. Mouse. Yeah. You know, listen, I, I, you know, I grew. That was the uh, Rye Playland is is very near and dear to me. That was, you know, uh, a place that we visited very frequently. You know, my parents split up when I was young. My dad would take us on Sundays, and we spent many Sundays. Um, in Playland, you know what? You know what was shot um, on the on the boardwalk there, Rye Playland. What great scene from what movie? That was the movie Big with Tom Hanks. You know when, when he when he goes to Zoltar and he, he goes, "I wish I was young again." That scene is shot. That scene is shot right there, at Rye Playland. It's great. Yeah, it's wild. A lot of history. A lot of history. I think wow. on the yeah. dragon coaster too. When they're on the roller coaster, that's the dragon coaster. The dragon coaster, bro. Yeah. Wow, I was yo, I was in that fun house many times. Yeah, he owned the fun house. That's and, incredible. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so um, there, there's uh, yeah, there's quite a history with entertaining people and stuff. And uh, my my father worked at Playland growing up. All my aunts and uncles, you know, they worked there. And holy shit, sure, that's uncle, great. I have I have um family uh, recently. Uh, my uncle gave me like super eight footage. Of like us, you know, going to ride. It's all ride playland and stuff as kids, like going on the drag, all that shit at ride playland. It's great stuff. Nice. You know? Yeah. So how did how did music? So why drums? Why did you gravitate to drums? And how did your drum career get going? Um. Well, my on my other side of the family, my mother's side, her youngest brother, my uncle Russell, he's a drummer. Um, and so going to holidays over at grandma's house, you know, growing up, I'm the oldest grandkid on that side. So going over, uh, to the house, you know, holidays and stuff, we'd always wind up upstairs in his drum room and he's, he'd do a drum solo or something. You know, he was like very in the style of Stuart Copeland. Um, he big police fan, like eighties, eighties rock, eighties, new great age. drummer. So he'd always do like some big drum solo thing. And me, I'm just hypnotized by the drums. So it started there, uh, as a little kid, just being around it all the time. When I finally got old enough to get into music and like really want to do something, I tried guitar first <laughs> and I couldn't do it. I right. couldn't do it because several, I, I was just set up to fail, right? Uh, I want to play lefty. I'm a righty through and right. through, but I would play lefty. And this uh, church lady guitar player that I got hooked up with for guitar lessons, 
first of all, I wanted to show acoustic kumbaya songs, and she was telling me I was playing wrong. So none of this was going my way. So I was destined to fail. I think I lasted <laughs> six months, and I was like, Psh, later. So uh, talking to my uncle, he was like, look, I got my old drum set it's sitting in, in the attic. Um, I'm not using it. I'll give it to you, but I don't want to give it to you just to make a bunch of noise and drive everyone crazy. How old were you at this time? Uh, around now, I was 13. There you go. Good yeah, age. 12 13, 12, 13 years old. So, um, yeah, take some lessons. See if you like it. If you like it, I'll give you the drum set and you're off to the races. And that's really what happened. I took some lessons. I got hooked up with this really great teacher at a local music spot. He's in the city now. He's been there uh, for years and years. His name's Mike Shapiro. I actually hooked up with him. Facebook and all this good stuff. You know, it does good that's sometimes. Awesome. You can you can hook up with people that you have. Yeah, man. Oh, Facebook. Facebook's been good to me for the most part. It's been good. It's been good yeah, to me. Too. I got to agree. So my, my drum teacher, I, I took lessons and he was teaching me the music I wanted to learn as well as you're reading out of the book and learning a little bit of that stuff too. So that's good. It was well-rounded. And uh, yeah, man, you just start jamming with friends in school and all that stuff. Next thing you know, you're in a local band and you're meeting more people and your world's just exploding. And early on, early on, what drummers spoke to you as a young teenager? Like who, who, who really, who touched you? Well, I got to say first, of course, John Bonham. My, my, one of my cousins turned me on to Zeppelin. Sure. Bill Ward, Black Sabbath. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got into Iron Maiden, Nico McBrain, a little wow. more technical, and that was more metal. And then yeah, once yeah. I got exposed to Metallica, that opened up the thrash thing for me, and that was it. Game over. I was just absorbing everything. Uh, Gar Samuelson from Megadeth, even Nick Menza later on, Dave Lombardo from Slayer, my favorite drummer, uh, all the thrash stuff. You yeah. Know? Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's that's really, I, I was always a metal guy first. Hardcore and punk came later. And um, so then getting into to punk, I think, or, or hardcore rather. So I'm in the metal world and I got exposed to some Madball and Marauder. And I'm there like, well, what's this? And then that takes you back down the trail of where did that come from? Okay, New York City. Then it's like, pro sure. man. AF, sick of it all. Sick of it all was another one, actually. And New York's had some great hardcore drummers, like you know, uh, there's been Mackie and you know Earl from the Bad Brains, and you know, there's been some great hardcore drummers out of New York. You know? Yeah, I, I really like Armand from Sick of It All. Oh, Ash, the machine. And he's a great dude. Yeah, he's a machine. He's a machine. So he was another one that, like, in in that genre of music, I started listening to him. Just look sure. around, and, and there you go. And was was. Like literally one of the first bands you found yourself in, Hatebreed? No, well, I did some local stuff, but as far as like serious stuff goes, yeah. I mean, I played with plenty of local bands around here. A lot of great players from this area. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was going to school. Actually, I've always been, I've always kept my, my foot in the school thing. So I was going Good. to school to be a teacher. Um, and I was going up in uh, to Plattsburgh, New York. And a mutual friend of ours, I know, right? Way up in the boonies, and here I am. So I just like, it's like a real, this show has a real upstate New York vibe to it. Wappingers Falls, Poughkeepsie, Plattsburgh. Like, I know. <laughs> you know who's from Plattsburgh? You know who's from Plattsburgh? Billy G from Biohazard. So, yeah, because his, I, you know, it's funny you say that. Yes, he is. Because years later, a couple of my friends had his father as a teacher. He taught uh, at SUNY right. So Mr. I was G. like, your dad. And I, a day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here I am on tour with Billy, and I'm like, I was just going to Plattsburgh. We're right. in Europe. Uh, you know, we're opening for Biohazard on one of the, the resistance tours or something. I'm like, man, I was just, I was with your dad like two years ago. <laughs> That's awesome. That's <laughs> fucking great. But uh, yeah, awesome. I was going to school to be, be a teacher and, uh, you know, local stuff. And mutual friend hooked us, hooked me and Hatebreed up at the time. And hey, I needed a band. They needed a drummer. So tried out, got the gig, and uh, that was 1998, and I was in the band for almost a year, and uh, just kind of whatever, we were just different people, and it was a little rowdier back then, it was just crazy, oh, so I, yeah. dro I dropped out, I was going to go back to school, ended up hooking up with All Out War, who were local guys here, Newberg, uh, right. been around forever, toured with them for two years, that kind of fizzled out, Mike's a teacher, he's going back to school to be a teacher, I was still, still had my foot in the school teacher thing, and um, Hatebreed, you know, I was on Ozfest at that time. They had lost their drummer. They gave me a call and was back. Just it started out just filling in for some stuff, and then uh, just here you go. The snowball started, and here we are, twenty years later. I mean, was it was it um, easy to step back into uh, to Hatebreed at that point? Was was it 
was it comfortable or, or, or was it like a whole new thing? It actually was really comfortable. I can remember the day, you know, they came back around and there was some OzFest shows, Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts, Jersey. And I hadn't played with them in three years, two years. So Sean uh, reached out and was like, yeah, let's do a band practice. You know, it was, it was a day off and they were in Connecticut. Cool. Figured I'll drive out, run through the set, you know, just shake the rust off and uh, jump in for the shows. And that's really what it was. It was in, in typical hate breed fashion. I showed up to practice and it was just Sean there. <laughs> Nobody else showed up. And uh, me and Sean just kind of shrugged like, hey, this is how it is. And we played like we hadn't missed a beat, man. We hadn't missed a beat. It was pretty amazing, actually, because I hadn't seen those dudes in years. And and really, you, you sort of, when you rejoined the band soon after, you went in and, and, and recorded this. Yeah, Perseverance, 2002. Two, end of 2001 into 2002. Yeah, and that, you know, that's major that's uh, studio. It was, it was a big experience. You know, that was my first, it was big. Everything about it was big, big band going into a realm of major label, trying to be bigger, huge fan base, huge tours, huge production. And know. that, that, that record was, that was you, you, you were on the big stage. That was universal records, correct? Yeah. Universal records had signed the band. We had just signed with management, just signed with universal. We did the album at Longview Farms in uh, Massachusetts. Oh, hell yeah. You know, Bad Brains did an album there. Creed, Seven Dust, Gladys, Night, and the Pit. No, that's, that's like, that's up there with like Caribou Ranch. You know, that's like, that's <laughs> like, that's heavy, man. Yeah, that's heavy. great spot. You know, it was a big farm. The Stones rehearsed there they, for a tour. For the yeah. 1980, the, the Stones rehearsed there for the 1981 tour. I remember it well. There you go. You know? And they I was had pictures up and everything. It was it was wild. It was wild. Yeah, a a absolutely. And like you know, all our people are chiming in. You know, Scott Earth from Silence Equals Death, and 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 Joseph Miranda, and and, and everybody. You know, people fucking love this record, man. I mean, this record, you know, really resonates with a lot of people all these years later. And you must be very proud of that. I am. I am to have this be my first major. Uh, major experience like major recording experience or on a major label you know the touring that would come after that and just to even now you know we play a song like i will be heard live and it hits as hard as it did when we were playing it in 2002 so that really shows that uh you know this music really resonates well with people and our fans are very loyal and we're loyal to them and, and uh i mean that right there that album is 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 it's an older album now it's it's you know yeah. it's yeah, not a spring it's, chicken anymore <laughs> have you gone at, have you gone at what is it how, is it almost it's almost 20 years right 2002 so yeah next year 20 years i mean you guys are gonna have to do out and be you know go out and be like you know hate breed playing perseverance in its in in, in its entirety you know we got to do one of those deals yeah absolutely <laughs> you know? so Heck yeah yeah. yeah, it's an album. It's an album you destroy your apartment to, man. We've heard it up and down. People put it on, and it's just they go nuts. And to have that effect on people is pretty amazing, and it's an honor yeah. <laughs> to be part of um, it. It is shout out Sunday, D. Kavitz. Uh, shout out to Charlie Watts because you know we touched on the Rolling Stones. Shout out to Charlie Watts, who I saw. Uh, Charlie Watts is like eighty years old, and he's still playing drums in the Stones. You know. How amazing is that? I, I saw them I play know. recently. I was like, what? <laughs> Take care of yourself and you're all good. Good looking guy, man. He's still dapper, you know? Yeah, yeah. He, he, he. And good there's boy. no, there's no, um, there's no smoke and mirrors with that dude. It's not like they have a, you know, it's like, it's him. That's it. He's the only one playing drums, you know? And I think, isn't he the oldest one in the band? Yeah, he is. Yeah. Yep. Still yep. rocking it. What's, um, I want to quote you, and maybe you could you could sort of decipher this a little bit. Um, I, I, I uh, saw this in an in a interview when I, uh, with you when I was doing when I was doing my homework. Um, to me, the jazz players are the original punk rock players. There is a structure and a solid backbeat to their songs, but they don't operate by a defined set of rules within that structure. Could you break that down for us? Improv. Yeah. A lot of jazz, a good portion of funk, it's all based in uh, improvisation. You have a rough blueprint 
a rough structure, I feel. And the players, if you know your craft, you know your your instrument, and you know, and 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 you're on that vibe, that that particular vibe that you're riding, you just move in and out of that, and you still make it work. And I love the whole concept of improv, especially live. You know, um, I say. Uh, that I, I kind of take that into my own approach and my own playing that whole um, improvisa improvisational approach to the live setting. What you get on a hate breed record is the live stuff or is the recorded stuff, the song yeah. structure solid. And then usually what I do live is different from that. And there's a couple reasons for that. I like that being in the hot seat approach of the show and like, you know, doing different fills or nothing major that's going to throw the song off and, and screw the fans up from what they want to hear. But I like to throw curveballs live. I love it because it's like it's an added freshness for the for the live setting, whereas the studio songs are like they are and they're captured in time forever. And that's great. Live, you're going to get a little something different, I'd like to shake it up a little bit. So there is a space for improvisation, even with a band that you would think is so structured as Hatebreed. Yeah, I try. I, yeah, I think so. Um, I've made it work. For example, like uh, Satisfaction is the Death of Desire you know, insanely popular hate breed album. I didn't play on it, but right. I've been in the, right. in the, in the band 20 years now. So we still play all those songs. And uh, over the years, I've kind of just taken them and uh, done my own thing with them and uh, just add them, add little things here. I just really just make them my own um, with a fill here and there or a certain part. I add just something, you know, always throwing candy, always throwing some spice in the pot. Yeah. I think that really brings to the live show. So, um, that's what I'm talking about with that. You know, um, I, I, I love when a drummer, like from a fan standpoint, watching a band, I like when the band does that, throws you some curveballs. you know, like makes the live show. You're just like, Whoa, what are they going to do next? You know, just little things. Another, another quote of yours. Um, I, and I quote, hate breed requires a lot of stamina and is definitely endurance music. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You I mean, you're working hard back there, man. Sweating, sweating. Um, it's, uh, I mean, you know, look at the New York hardcore bands, look at the Connecticut yeah. hardcore bands. Shout out to CT, uh, HC as well. I have to right. say I am ingrained in that. So we cannot not show love to them. Um, you know, you know, you know, I wanted to ask you, let, 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 me, let me, let's veer off here a little bit. Anybody, you know, anybody from that, anybody from that era, um, when you came up, you know, I mean, we always talk about, you know, Poughkeepsie and what a vibrant scene it was around the chance and stuff like that. I, I mean, at, at Albany and Troy and, and there was just so much going on. Um, who were your peers? Like, what were the bands that were like your peers? In, in, and I know we're stepping back in, in that era when you were like in All Out War and early Hatebreed. And is there anybody that you thought, you know, really, wow, the, the, that, that you thought, any unsung heroes? Um, well, when I was first playing locally and uh, otherwise, just like, yeah, around Poughkeepsie, a little bit of Connecticut, uh, Albany. I remember a band Section 8. And oh, yeah. uh, they were huge in Albany, you know. And they, they, uh, they had their own thing going on compared to other bands that were from up there. And uh, I always thought like they were they were going to be like they were going to do that life of agony thing, you know, because they kind of had that vibe to them and they were going to be that man. They were going to be huge. Um, spent a lot of time playing with those guys um, around here. There was a band called Dissolve and they were like the, the kings of heavy music around here. Back okay. in the mid 90s. Uh, Good name. Early 90s, mid 90s. Yeah, they're still around, actually. They still play. Not cool. as often. You know, we're all getting a little older here, but they're still yep. they still represent around here. Um, yeah. And, and then in Connecticut, there was hate breed, you know, that they were, they yeah. were the big dogs in Connecticut. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like th those are the, those were the bands that you would play with. You'd try to get on those shows with those bands, you know, you um, go. section eight inner dam eye to eye. Yeah. Across yeah. the river, they were Newburgh bands, Middletown bands. Um, they had, they had, uh, beneath the remains is another one. Um, one king down. Yeah, one king down Albany. Yeah, yeah. We had the skate park over there in Newburgh yeah. Planetarium. A uh, lot of shows used to come through there. Biohazard played there. Back I remember. The yeah, you know, yeah, big spot when when Jamie was on the show, I was talking to him about when I was managing Marauder in like '96 or '97. We we came up and and 
and I guess Jamie promoted the show. Hatebreed was on the bill, and we stayed at Jamie's parents' house. And his parents and I slept in his sister's. I slept in his sister's room. His sister wasn't around, but <laughs> I, I slept in his sister's room. And like Marauder, we like took over Jamie's parents' house. <laughs> <laughs> he did that a lot. That was that was it, right? Because even like talking with Frank Three Gun, he's like, you know, I'm in the band now, but I remember back in the day, Hatebreed would roll through Cleveland and they would stay at my house. Right. That's what you did, right? Yep. Finding on finding floors to crash on as you went. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> a absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, back back to the task at hand. Uh, talking about uh, perseverance. And then I think the next the next year, right, was Rise of Brutality, uh, yeah. and 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 so on and so forth. One sort of constant uh, with the with the hate breed and the hate breed breed sound has been the producer Zeus, correct? Yes. Yep. I mean, you guys have worked with him quite a bit. Yeah. Well, started. And with why 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 is why is that? Well, he knows us. He knows our sound. He knows what he's got to bring out of us. Right. Draw out of us, even now to this day, to keep us fresh, you know, to keep it current, to keep it heavy, to keep it new. You yeah. know, I'm eight albums in, nine albums for Hatebreed total. Uh, you know, you, at some point, you got to switch things up a little bit just to keep it fresh. You don't ever want to go stale. So, um, yeah, he's it, it started with Perseverance. He was the engineer on that album. Um, of course, he's, you know, he's been around everyone too. Western Mass guy. You know, yeah. every bands are playing Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, everywhere. So he was in bands and uh, he's done a lot of bands over the years. I think right now he's working on Queensryche or something like that. But wow. with us, he, it started out, he engineered Perseverance. And um, as we went on, it was like, we don't need big producer. We don't need big budget stuff. Like we can do it in your garage and pump some money into the equipment or something and just like, you know us, you know what we're supposed to sound like. We can nurture that. And, 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 you know, and there you go. That's what it is. So it just made more sense monetarily and, and just, you know, think it's smart and, and, uh, and uh, just about the music. Like he knows how to hit the nail on the head. Do you guys, do you guys record all the, like, uh, I mean, in, in the same, is it, in the same studio with him or have you gone to, or is it usually a different studio or, or is there like a consistency there with the studio? It's changed over the years. I think every record has been a different uh, production experience, recording experience. I see. We had his studio in Western Mass. We did a couple albums there. A lot of bands have. Right. Uh, the last couple albums we've done in Connecticut um, at a smaller studio now with, um, with another friend of the band, Nikki. Uh, he's got his place, uh, Dexter's Lab. So actually, the last three albums we've done there. So that's been our spot. But then, right. you know, you go back to Perseverance. That was the big studio uh, experience. So, um, yeah, every record's been kind of different. Zeus has always been a part of it. I think now with technology and everything so streamlined now, it, it, compared to when you go back where you needed a big board and a big drum room and all that stuff, not to say you still don't need the drum room, but, I mean, guys are rolling around with mobile rigs, man. They can just roll yeah. into your basement. It's and crazy. get a record that sounds like Peter Frampton live or whatever you want to call it, you know, like yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't, it takes a lot, but the, that a lot is now just put in such a small package that dudes just roll like it's nothing streamlined. Yeah, abs absolutely. Hey, let me um, shout out my sponsors. Let's take a little break here and uh, we'll be back in a couple minutes and we'll do album of the week with Sid the Kid. Okay. What's happening, everybody? This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Our guest today is Matt Byrne from Hatebreed and formerly All Out War. We are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, Chacho's Tacos, Generation Records, and DTFM Vinyl Distro. It's a record store that specializes in underground music, punk, ska, hardcore metal, and more. Located in the heart of Fargo, North Dakota's Industrial District, shop in person or online at www.dtfmvinyldistro.com, where the motto is, death to false metal. Also, lest we forget, New York Hardcore Comics opened back in 2013, selling comic books, punk, rock, and hardcore memorabilia 
toys, statues, skateboards, toys, statues, skateboard decks, tapes, vinyl, and all things horror. We love helping bands push their demos and new tracks, so please stop by and drop off your new music. We have in-store events like Magic the Gathering and Warhammer tournaments, plus meet and greets with bands and some live performances. Open seven days a week and shipping worldwide. Find us online through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and eBay, located at 117 Main Street in lovely Dobbs Ferry, New York, www.newyorkhardcorecomics.com. Want to mention a couple of shows coming up. Here we go. A week from today, Sunday, June 27th, the day before my birthday. Come on now. Mr. Max Cavalera coming on the show. Soulfly, Sepultura, Cavalera, Conspiracy, Kill or Be Killed, Go Ahead and Die. A couple days after that, Steve Birnbaum. From the Instagram page, the band was here. Super cool page uh, where he lines up uh, band photos with the location. I'm really looking forward to that one. It's going to be a lot of fun. Two weeks from today, Sunday, July 11th, Mr. Sergio Vega from Quicksand, Deftones, Absolution. And a couple days after that, Mr. Scott Helland from Deep Wound, Outpatients, Guitar Me of One, and more. So we got a bunch of uh, great shows coming up. You know what? You know what? I want to announce a show. I haven't announced this one anywhere yet. Brand new show. Here you go. This one was in the cooker for a long time. I'm very personally excited about this. Here we go. Wednesday, July 21st. Come on now. Joey Shithead from DOA is coming on the show. Uh, he's a politician up in Canada now. This was a this was this one took a while, and uh, it's going down, kids. So we're really excited about this. Joey Shithead, what's up? DOA, one of my all-time favorite uh, hardcore bands. So yeah, who coined the phrase? There's the record right there on the flyer. Hardcore '81. You know the term hardcore really, as far as I know really didn't exist uh, in, 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 in the lexicon until DOA put that, put that record out. So yeah, kids, come on now. We're fortunate. People want to come on the show. People enjoy the show. So yeah, shithead, shithead in the house. Absolutely, man. So really excited about that one for sure. Also, got to mention that this Saturday, we have an event. It is the Hardcore Brunch with our guest of honor, Mr. Craig Satari. This is happening at the Organic Grill. Lest we forget. Hold on. I got to take advantage of this opportunity. The Organic Grill is a vegan restaurant located in East Village, New York City. What the great First Avenue. Featured in New York Magazine, New York Times, and Veg News. Their dishes have won numerous awards, including Best Veggie Burger. They make their own cheeses, sausages, and burger patties, and every dish on the menu could be made gluten-free for all you gluten-free motherfuckers. This year, they're celebrating the 21st anniversary, and they're all about having a great time while enjoying amazing, clean food. They have now fully reopened for business and look forward to seeing you. Get in touch with them. Order some great food at www.theorganicgrill.com. So this Saturday is the Hardcore Brunch with the guest of honor, Craig Satari, there's only a couple of tickets left. Only a couple of tickets left. You know, open up your wallet. Take that yarmulke off. Don't be shy. It's, what is it, 20 bucks, 25 bucks. You know, um, we're going to have a couple other guests there. I think Michael Lago's coming through. Uh, so I think there's five tickets left. So don't be scared. Buy a ticket. Come hang out with us. All right? You fucking people, you know something? People are pissing me off, all right? You know you people like to watch this freaking show. Come out and hang out with us in person once in a while, will you? Please? Face to face, you keyboard warrior. And for all you lurkers out there, all you people that, that watch this show and lurk, I'm, I'm always amazed when, when somebody turns up and says, you know, I watch all, you know, I watch all the show. I've seen every show or I saw this. And I saw, I'm like, really? Why don't you chime in once in a while? You friggin' lurker. 
This goes out. It's Sunday shout out day. So I'm going to shout out all you lurkers out there. Uh, there is a Patreon page where you can support this show. It's what makes this show happen. Don't be shy. Please support this show. There's also a PayPal. Uh, if you want to make a, a, a donation, uh, please support this show. Um, that's what makes this, this whole thing happen. Um, you know, that said, yeah, you'll drive up from Florida. Come on, Paulie, get cracking. Le leave soon. Um, yo, lurkers, lurkers unite. There is hope for you all, all you lurkers. My mind gets blown. I, I talk to people sometimes. They go, oh, I watched this. I'm like, really? Yo, you can reach out to me anytime. You know that. Anybody out there, I want to hear from you. Who would you like on the show? You know, what do you enjoy about the show? You know, all that. So <laughs> Vladimir Gluten, that's, that's a good one, bro. All right. You win with that one. Vladimir Gluten. That's good. Um, if you're watching the show in rerun, there is a subscribe button there. Please subscribe to Stone Films NYC YouTube page so you get an alert every time we do a new show. That would be cool too. Also, follow, follow on Instagram. What is the Instagram? There is an Instagram address. I know I'm preaching to the converted here, but you never know. There may be a few stragglers out there. Uh, there is the Instagram, Stone, at Stone Films NYC. Just don't fucking text me and don't send me messages during the show. It's amazing how many people send me shit in the middle of the show. That said, what else? What else? What else? What else? What else? Oh, you know what? Let's mention this. Let's mention this here. Coming up, another drummer. It seems like all we do is friggin' drummers on the show these days. How about EK uh, from formerly of Warzone and, uh, and Sick of It All? EK, Eric EK Comst coming on the show Wednesday, August 4th. So welcome to the New York Hardcore Chronicles live drummers show. So that, that will be happening. Uh, that said, uh, is everybody behaving themselves? Uh, yeah, yeah, Daisha. you know, where are all the women at? What's the matter? The women don't want to watch the show anymore? What happened to Lori Dawn and, and May? What's the matter? Did, did, did I say something? Did I not say something? My feelings are hurt. All the girls ran away. You know? Hmm. Let me see. All right, we'll get them back. What have I done? What have I done? So that said, uh, let me clear. Let me clear the deck here. Um, well, you, well, thank you. I love you too. You know, girls in hardcore. You know, it's not a lot of girls out there in hardcore. So we 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 liked having when we had like a good female crew. You know, there is a band called the Lurkers, bro. What do you think? That's unique. Probably 10 bands called the Lurkers, you know, the Jerkers. All right, let me clear the deck here. You got the PayPal address, and uh, let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of this. Everything's starting to move in slow motion. <laughs> we came out strong. We came out hot today, huh? Um, yeah, okay. I got my wits about me. That said, um, May shows up when she can. I, I know. Yep, yep. Okay. Let's bring our guest back on. And Mr. Matt Byrne. Hey, buddy. My wife's up there like, what's he talking about? Women. Wait, what? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Oh, no, man. Listen, you know. <laughs> it's a wild never, place. You know. <laughs> I'm, on dating, I'm on the dating circle. I'm on the dating circuit. No, I'm actually not. I'm dating someone. Um, hey, let's do this. You, me, let's bring on Sid the Kid and let's do album of the week together. Love it. There he is, Sid the Kid. What's happening? <laughs> what's up, guys? What's up, Matt? What's up, Drew? What's up? Kid the, kid the Sid, what's happening? Hey, wait, the ticker, the ticker, Drew. You always have to have me remind you. Whoa, whoa, 
ticker. one thing you know what sid let, let's do some hold on let me all right with the ticker here's your ticker yeah i'll give you the i ticker. remember this reminder i there's, should do something too sid i remember that there's this ticker all right oh wait you remember, remember the little logo thing that you hey, shut the fuck up bro. how's that sound how's that ring your bell shut the fuck up <laughs> wait 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 but what, what these two drew <laughs> you mean these things right here all right, hold on. Let, can we can we do can we do what you came on to do, and then and then we'll push your show. Yeah, you yeah, that? yeah. All right, all right. Here we go. I'm taking your ticker off here. Did you give me? You know. All right, here we go. Um, why my? Okay, album of the week. Here we go. Boom, boom, motherfucker. Okay, funkadelic hardcore jollies. Uh. All right, Sid. Sid, you really you, uh, you went off the beaten path today. This should be cool. Tell us a little bit about this record, Sid. Well, you know, Drew, I, I had to do something a little, little different today. You know, on this show, we're always full of surprises. So why not the fuck throw this one in today's mix? And this is Funkadelic's ninth studio album entitled Hardcore Jollies, which was released, I believe, on October, uh, oh shit, well, October 1976. And, you know, this peaked, and well, this was released on Warner Brothers Records. And when this came out, you know, it peaked at number 96 on the pop album charts and as well as number 12 on the R&B uh, charts. You know, this was also their first album to be issued on a major label. It was dedicated to the guitar players of the world, as quoted on, on the record. You know, originally, the first side of the album was called Osmosis Phase 1. And the second side was Terra... Ter uh, ter Vitus Phase 2, I know I probably butchered that. Uh, you know, Hardcore Jollies was released one month after Funkadelic's last album, uh, I believe, which was on uh, Westbound Records, Tales of Kid Funkadelic, which was made up of tracks recorded at, you know, at the same sessions. This would have been, uh, this would be Funkadelic's last album to feature original members uh, Fuzzy ha uh, Haskins, uh, Calvin Simon, and Grady Thomas, though uncredited. Yeah. Fuzzy Hackins, uh, Calvin and Grady, you know, they were they were also instrumentally, you know, on this record as well. And I believe Eddie Eddie Hazel was also yeah. uh, did a lot of the instrumental for this record too. You know, they would have they would leave because of like you know a lot of money issues. Like with a lot of bands, they leave. Well, yo, I just saw issues. I just saw there, I just watched. It just so happens this is timely because I just watched. There's a a um a documentary on Amazon Prime. I just watched about Parliament Funkadelic documentary and they lay all this out. I recommend it. It's wow, they, these this was a big party band, man. <laughs> <laughs> There's like well, how many people George Clinton too. George Clinton was paying everyone in cocaine, man. That's <laughs> that was going on with this band in the 70s. He was paying every you go out on the road and you play and you got paid in cocaine. You know? <laughs> you know I mean, one thing I, I did want to add, Drew, also, you know, bass, you know, being the main staple of funk music itself, you know, when you hear about the genre stuff, you think Flea, you think, you know, Marcus Miller, Verdi White, but honestly, Bootsy Collins is the fucking guy yep. when it comes to funk bass itself. Everybody knows who he is. Some people hear the name, but they don't really know where he, where he really came from. And it came from from this band itself, you know. Being that you know, this is that essential funk record for its time period, and over forty years later, it still stands up today. Yeah, I mean, it, it was uh, they were they were they were trailblazers, and uh, like I said, that documentary is is really great. Matt, um, I know I know that um, a, a lot of funk drummers really resonate with you. Uh, <laughs> And I know th this record was uh, what's his name Jerome Braley, right? Play plays plays on this rail. I think record. he plays on most of it, but I think even uh, Buddy Miles might have a tune or two on here. Yo, you're right on, brother. Awesome. I researched it. Buddy them Miles, them Buddy teams. Miles plays on this record as well. Um, yeah. could, could you tell us about how funk drummers influenced you and what your passion is for them? Oh man. Well, it started early, you know, taking drum lessons. And I, the teacher, as I said, Mike, my teacher at the time, uh, I was just a metalhead, you know, I was into the loud, crazy stuff. And he was like, that's great. And all, you know, and I'll, I'll show you how to do this or that. You want to know what they're doing? Uh, but you really should get into this. Like funk is a drummer's music, man. You should listen to this stuff. Like think about James Brown, you know, right now you're, 
you, you're looking at it like you're a dumb kid. You just look at it as your parents' music or whatever. Mm-hmm. But when you're really diving deep on it, yeah, that had that music had some of the best drummers in music. And that's the music that gets you moving. That that's the music that gets you dancing or just bopping your head. So um, once he turned me on to some of that stuff, like the big one was Tower of Power for me, David Garrett. Oh wow. And he's one of my favorite drummers, you know. Um, sure. My favorite in that genre. So, you know, the drummers, you know, the rudiments, the paradiddle. This dude was taking the paradiddle, and that's one of the things he's most famous for, is like breaking that into a beat with the ghost notes and everything and just this real groove, this real feel that it was just awesome, man. Once I, I was like, I got to know how to do that. You know, before it was like thrash and double bass, and I need to go as fast as I can and all this stuff and play as hard as I can. But now you're opening up a door of like, well, what if you just laid back a little bit and try to figure out how to actually pull a ghost note out of a snare drum and have that real solid backbeat going? Because that's what makes people move. And, you know, that's what when the accent hits, it's like, ugh. so, you know, really just create that deep groove. So when, once say, I when you say ghost them, note, is ghost note literally you're, you're just you're skipping a beat? Uh, it's soft. You, hit, you know, there's accents. Right. There's ghost notes. I see. So when you combine the two, it's like. Got it. You know, what have you. So, yeah, you you can create some really cool stuff on the drums uh, just around the kit. Really just you're just creating this really deep groove. And and it opens up the doors to all this other stuff to manipulate the drums in a way and make all these different sounds and create all these different grooves. So once I was on that tip. That was a whole other world for me. It exploded. And, and yeah, you, you fall down the James Brown rabbit hole. You fall down the Tower of pa- Power rabbit hole. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, the JB Horns, one, the guys who played horns with James Brown, they got their thing going on. Funkadelic, like, sky's the limit, man. Weather, rep- weather, weather Report, weather Billy Cobham. Weather, Cobb, weather Report, there you go. Yeah, yeah. 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 Lenny, White. Lenny White. Lenny White. Shit Korea, Lenny White. That's a big uh, Bad Brains yeah. influence. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and then it's cool because this is, I mean, so you have that, that world. And I try to bring that into my playing and I'm not the only one to do that. I mean, look back at these heavy bands where you could tell it's drummers music and the drummers were influenced by this stuff and they were taking those like groove variables and stuff and working it into thrash or like, look at Danny from biohazard. Oh my God, man. He's, he's, he's a hip hop drummer that's playing with a hardcore band. You know, that dude lays down solid groove. He hits like a gorilla. But at the same time, he knows how to play back that that backbeat too with the some of the ghosts and stuff. It just when I saw him doing that, he was the ultimate for me of combining those two worlds, the oh, metal wow. and and the funky stuff. I was like, yeah, that's that's another chapter of that's what I want to do. I got to figure out how to do that. Yeah, I spent I spent a lot of time with Danny for a couple of years, and I think early on, I sort of uh, I took it for granted. I, I didn't really I, I knew he was great. But, it, 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 you know, in retrospect now, I really see, you know, how it, sort of pioneering he was in a certain way with a, bringing a lot of that stuff into, uh, you know, a, into a hybrid hardcore metal band, you know? Absolutely. And the yeah. halftime stuff, you know, yeah. crashing on the China, but at the same time, you're really working the snare yeah. with these beats like these that are hip hop beats. They're paradiddle based beats like sure. between the kick and the snare and you're just holding the groove with these. Oh, man. People are like, that's that's caveman style. It is. He's hitting like a caveman. <laughs> more to it. You need to explore it. It's great. Yeah. Sid, did you Sid, did you enjoy doing your research for this one? Hey, the teacher had to throw me the homework. I had to go a little do a little researching. You and, did good, man. Hey, you were surprised because I mean, you know, this band's been around forever. Their their discography is fucking fast as hell. Staggering. And I looked and looked and looked, and I was like. And I threw it at you, and you were like, "Boom!" And then I, I went to work on it. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, I mean, we don't need to we don't need to veer off here. But in the documentary, you see how George Clinton had a band called Parliament, a band called Funkadelic. He had he had you know this that he had multiple record deals. All he had a lot going on with all this and all these different players and the, and and the, and the 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 high level of talent between Bernie Worrell on keyboards, Bootsy Collins, you know, it, it's uh, the people that went, th- that ran through this band. It's like, holy shit. It was, it was like, it was like a boot camp for some of the greatest players, you know? Yeah. Bands like that, 
they always have the greatest players. Yeah. The greatest players always want to be in that band. They're like, I got to be in that band. You know, one you know guy. Who's another, you know who's another one? Frank Zappa. Totally. Totally. That's right. Yeah. Look, uh, yeah. Terry Bazio, nine, 18 years old. You know, five. Ter Terry Bazio, Vinny Kaliuta. Yeah, Kaliuta. Chad Wackerman. Uh, you know, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, um, who plays in Genesis? Um, uh, oh, Collins? No, the other one. Oh, no. Bill Collins doesn't play drums in Gen uh, They uh, He has, uh, what's his name? Chester Thompson. I just wanted to say Phil Collins because I know how much. You know, I can't stand him, right? And as I get older, I'm starting to look more and more like him. <laughs> you, you, right. love, you love to hate him, Drew. Yeah, listen. You know. <laughs> hey, Sid, thank you. You did great, great job today. Hey, it's the least I could do. Oh, true. Did you get that? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, yo, yeah, yeah, I did. Hold on, hold on. I got it. I got it. Oh, where is the sin? Where is From the, the ticker? Yeah. Yeah. Here, <laughs> hold your horses. Here you go, Sid. Here. Didn't you do this show already? What is this, Sid? Uh, yes, I did. But for those who missed it, guys, I'm actually rebroadcasting this. There was a little bit of some audio issues. Cleaned them up, fixed it, and now it's ready to go again. Uh, coming up tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, I have members of Havoc, which if you don't, don't know, they were like an old old style, like, you know, uh, L.A. punk band. I mean, if it's in more in your wheelhouse, but obviously these dudes and just like it's, you know, yeah, punk rock. But you know what? You got to see what these guys listen to before punk. And then I played a lot of stuff that a lot of people were surprised that I play. Just like on this show, I threw you guys that curveball. Oh, shit. This bit, this record, you know, these guys in this not just punk rock. They listen to other shit besides punk rock. There's other music out there, people. It's done goes down the rabbit hole. There you know, but, yeah. How'd you know? But anyway, <laughs> guys, you know, feel free to check. You know, check out my show. Go to uh, mixlr.com backslash SDK Sound System. It's gonna be on at six o'clock tonight. So after the show, you want to listen to a little music while you're making your dinner, or you know, I want to say doing it with your lady, but something you know, something to pass the time tonight. Yeah, let's not, don't, yeah, I, I don't want, you, you know, you're the last, last thing I want to hear when I'm humping my girl is, is, is Sid the Kid. Well, All hey, right, bro, I, at least on my radio show, Drew, I minimize the talking, play the music, because that's the center stage of the show, not me. You're, you're a great DJ. And, and one, one quick shout out before I get the fuck out of here. Obviously, you know, it is Father's Day, you know, we've been shouting out all our dads. Not so close to my dad, but if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here. And I'll just leave it at that, guys. All right, Sid, thank you. All righty, guys, and have a good Talk one, and enjoy the show, everybody. Thanks a lot, guys. All Thanks. right, take care. Well, there you go. We, we survived. That, we nice survi that was survived. a nice treat. Nice treat. You know? Yeah, I got I – got, I have a picture I want to ask you about. Hold on. Uh -huh. All right, no, I have, to, I have to find it again. It's, it's blown out. Hold on. Here we go. Here we go. Found it. Patient. Boom, boom, boom. Hey, listen, it's a one-man show, you know? You're killing it. I could sit back and just watch you guys go back and forth. That's what, That was my plan. I'm like, I'm not going to talk it's much. It's exhausting even watch. It, it's exhausting just watching me do it, right? <laughs> Who is this gentleman in this photo with you? That is Mr. Bernard Purdy. Yeah. One of the most talking about groove, talking about yeah. drummers, talking about groove drummers. He is it. He is uh, he's one of the most recorded drummers in music history. A lot of R&B. He sure is. Played with, uh, you know, Steely Dan. He's played with. He uh, played on Steely Dan Asia and the Royal Scam. Yeah. He yeah. played. Uh, I, I think. I think he was a Wasn't he Aretha Franklin's uh, music director for fucking years? Long time, long time. Yeah. He even played on some Beatles stuff. Oh, I read about that. That's crazy. That whole bit. Yeah. yeah. And his yeah. his like his trademark uh, in the drumming world, his trademark is the Purdy Shuffle. It's come to be known as the Purdy Shuffle, and it's a shuffle style beat, a lot of ghost notes, and uh, it's a it's kind of it's a shuffle on the hi hat with ghosting on the on the snare with some quarter notes on the kick, and it just creates a, think think um, Rosanna Toto, right? The drum beat for the chorus. Meet you all the way. Right. right. That's yeah. Rosanne. yeah, that's a groove. That that's a groove. That's a groove. That's yeah. A groove. And and that style beat, I think, is like it's I know in, in my world, you know, 
drum dork world, but that's the beat that everyone's got to learn how to play. Like, whoa, yeah. what is that? How, how the hell you even do that? And you dissect it and you sit at the kit for hours until you can nail it. And you'll never be as good as him. But um, it's one of my favorite beats to play. And I think I got it down pretty well up to this point. I'm forever a student, but it's sounding pretty damn good. So, uh, yeah, I, I love his playing. And seeing him, he actually played uh, across the river here, a little town called Marlboro, New York. There's oh, a there place you go. called Falcon. Uh, and it's a cool club. They get a lot of acts like random stuff. They promote, but they got their marquee out front. And it's not uh, unheard of to be driving by and being like, whoa, Bernard Purdy's going to be there? What? You know, I found, yeah, I stopped in and, uh, you know, we got tickets, me, me and the wife, and we went and we sat. It's a one level stage. It's not this huge place. Everything's made of wood. It's those old wood style buildings. And like, there's a lot of them left. There's a lot of them still left uh, in, in upstate New York, man. Cabin style. It's like a cabin, but yeah, you know, small stage. Sure. And, uh, they have multiple rooms in there. The big room, you could get food, you can get drinks. And we're, we went for dinner and we're two rows back from the stage eating dinner, watching Bernard Purdy kill it with, uh, you know, a band, a bunch of dudes he's played with over the years. Local guys, Jersey guys. I think he was down in Jersey. He came up, and it was the best thing because we got there early. We're the first ones sitting down. He's doing sound check, just walking around, and we were like, "Hey, Bernard! Wow!" This I mean, at this at this point, he's he's like an elder statesman, and he's like a teacher, really, right? He's royalty. Yeah, he's royalty. I mean, yeah, yeah. And there's some great stuff. I see. Uh, you know, he does on YouTube. He's got a lot of stuff, and. Uh, He's he's got some great instructional videos out there, small clips on YouTube from his instructional stuff with Hudson Music and uh, sure. and whatnot or whoever he did it with. And just go check out the YouTube Bernard Purdy. It's his shuffle instruction stuff. He's a character. He's funny to watch, funny to listen to. He throws humor in everything he does. And that's part of the appeal. Let's talk about this a little bit. What's going on here? That was uh, a hey, oh. That was that was another incredible experience in my life. Uh, this was when I had the opportunity three years ago to sit in with the 8G band on Late Night with Seth Meyers. Um, that was an incredible experience. If you don't know the uh, history behind it, Fred Armisen is the house drummer, and when he's uh, when he's off filming movies and all sorts of stuff that he does, Fred's a good dude. I've I've worked with Fred a couple of times. Uh, you know, we 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 did uh, a couple of things together. Uh, he's he's a really uh, um, genuine, uh, you know, down to earth lover of punk rock music uh, guy. He's yeah, he's really he's his roots are deep in punk rock, and he has such an appreciation yeah. for music, indie rock, like all of it. Yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, and yeah. he handpicked the musicians for this band, and these guys are. Uh, you know, pretty. D I I think they're all from D.C. If I remember correctly, or hmm. most of them are. But they were in the, the D.C. scene. They're all great players. Um, the band is sick, and you have an opportunity so that they have this rotating uh, drummer program where, when Fred's not there, Eric, one of the producers, he handpicks a drummer to come on for that particular week, and uh, you sit in with the band, and you're in the hot seat, man. Yeah, uh, it's unlike anything you've ever done before. So. Uh, you got to have your chops about you. You got to have your wits about you. You got to pay attention. And it was a wild experience, man. It takes about an hour to film the show. Right. And uh, you're just, you're buzzing. Like you're, you're do, watching the stage manager. Do, do you know, them. do you know what's coming up as a drummer in that situation? Or do they just call it out and you just got to jump in? No, you, you rehearse, you do some rehearses, uh, rehearsals okay. of, you know, like walkout music and commercial music and you basically sure. write jingles, uh, eight sure, sure. parts, you know, um, do the thing. And, uh, yeah, you just, you sit in and, and you, you do it <laughs> and you're yeah. watching all the moving parts and you got to go along with it. Yeah. There's people and, calling the shots and you got to hit it on, hit it on the one when it's time. And, and that, and that show is shot, is shot in Rockefeller center, right? Yes, Thirty Rock. So did you? Did you? You came down and you did you commute every day or did you stay in the city? I stayed in the city. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, uh, it's, enough, it's nervous enough doing the thing, you know. I mean, that's exciting, man. That, that, it's one of those things, like you know, there's there's the first show is kind of wow, how, how, you feel your way through it, and then after that, it's the most amazing experience ever. Yeah. And when it's time to leave, you don't want to leave. You want to be the house drummer for the rest of your life. 
because it was so much fun and, and uh, everyone's so cool there. And they're great players. And it's just dialed in, man, dialed in. It's another it's another world from from, you know, getting up on stage and playing a festival in Europe or playing the chance here in Poughkeepsie or Seabees or whatever. Uh, you know, now you're in front of cameras and this is going to be shown later to millions of people and a lot of moving parts. Yeah, it's it's, it's a different world. Like I said, I have a friend that uh, my oldest friend in the world um, is the is um, the I guess we'll call him the technical director of the Colbert show. And uh, before that, he, he, he was the Letterman show. He basically technically runs the whole show. And I've been to I've been to the show many times to see them, you know, shoot it. And it's it's uh, it's it's pretty intense and it's, it's great. It's, it's exciting. It's a very exciting thing. You know, uh, you know, with the band and, and and what they do musically, you know. I give all of them credit for for having this program dialed in as it is. I mean, nothing yep. goes to chance. Everything yeah. is is ready, and and everyone's on cue, and all these moving parts, and it's a well oiled machine, and it goes off like it's that's how they do it, man. It's just sure. perfect every night. Now, yeah. when you're not doing the, when you're not doing the hate breed thing. Um, when you're not in the studio or on the road, I know Hapri goes out on the road and pretty, I mean, do you guys tours like I mean, uh, pandemic aside? And I, I know that right when the pandemic hit, you guys had a record that was just coming out. Right. And, yeah. and, and that got kind of stymie, but I guess you, you still tour as much as you ever did under normal circumstances. Right. Ah, uh, yes. And no, I, yeah, I, we still tour heavy, but not as heavy as we did back in the day. I think we reached a point where, we started taking quality over quantity yeah. uh, and that comes with age. It comes with guys uh, starting to get married and have kids and stuff and, and right. you know, developing more of a home life where you don't want to be out 300 days a year. Sure. Um, so I'd say like, yeah, there was, I mean, there was a good four or five, six years there straight uh, starting with perseverance where we were doing well over 300 shows a year. And now wow. uh, I think we've, yeah, yeah, it was a grind. But Three it was over 300 year. shows a year. Just, just hitting it, man. We played wherever. You know, uh, you it's were, incredible. It's incredible that Jamie could sing 300 shows a year. I give him a lot of credit with that because, yeah, it's the way he talks now. It already, he's got the gravelly voice now, and now he's screaming at the top of his lungs every night. And you know, hate breed, as with a lot of bands who are, or we do it for a living, right? We're road dogs. A lot of bands out there are. You're not taking days off. Days off cost money. Right. So. Right. And and it, that's what always amazes me, like. You know, bands, it's, it's hard for b hardcore bands and heavy and real heavy, heavy metal type bands to like, it's hard day after day for the singer, man. That's why like, I'm always in awe of like Lou from Sick of It All. Like that dude takes a beating on yeah, that dude. And, and he's, I, that's, he's one, he's one of my favorite front men. He's out there like taking a beating every, and I, I take a beating when we do antidote shows, you know, but we, we, we never were like a touring band. I, I do. I could do two or three shows. I'm done, you know, done. Vocally. So that's just vocally. Then you, you're they're like, yeah, take Lou right. and Pete and Craig. Now they're running around all over the place too, jumping yeah. up and down and they're just giving right. it 120%. So yeah. Yeah, when you're not taking days off, it's going to catch up with you after a while or after a couple of years or whatever. So yeah. I think, you know, over the years, we've just backed off of the grind a little more and, uh, and, and just take stuff that's more makes sense with everyone's lives. And, you know, uh, the touring uh, cir circuit with, uh, you know, the record cycle and everything. Well, speak, speaking of all that, this caught my eye. Um, I guess this was recently announced. This is, um, uh, you explain, ex explain what this is, buddy. This is, uh, so this is one of the largest festivals in Europe. Every summer it takes place in France. Uh, it's called Hellfest, and it's become probably the biggest uh, festival in Europe for the summer. I mean, you got Wacken, you have Download. Those draw huge numbers there. Wacken in Germany, uh, Download in England. But this, if you see the full flyer uh, for this, the lineup of this festival over a four-day period, you can't think of a band that's not on it. It's that yeah. And this year being even mad, even mad balls on the friggin' thing. Mad I see, <laughs> mad, I, Immediately, mad Hoya, I love it. It's always great running into Hoya and the guys because the, it always goes into some shit talking session about this or that. And it's the most fun to just, it, you know, the European festival setup is like, 
you're backstage. You have these shipping containers as dressing rooms. They really take care of you. It's great. A lot of drinks, and you're just sitting around with guys from home, and it's the middle of summer, and the weather's great, and you're just talking shit, man. It's great. <laughs> you, know, you know, just looking at this lineup, like bands that resonate for me. Like, and, and this is what's so cool is like it's been a minute. Well, it's been a, it's been a little bit. I mean, a while back we went and played the Iperfest, Antidote did, and yeah. you like sort of, you wander around, be like, oh, like, oh shit, bands you never get to go, never get to see. Like, I see Ugly Kid Joe is on this. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, I'd go see Ugly Kid Joe, and I, there's a band on there called Year of No Light. I don't know what they sound like, but I'd go see them because of I, that's a cool name. I go see <laughs> But of course, merciful fate. I mean, come on, bro. You know, yeah. I'll always catch Napalm Death, one of my favorite bands ever. You know, they always up the bar too. Their last is album. that Carcass too? Is Carcass playing there? Carcass is on there. Yeah, they're always Magnet. great. Carcass brings it, man. Monster Magnet. So, so all these bands are on this particular day, Sunday. There's four other days, three other days. So this is Sunday, broken up over like six or seven stages on the on the grounds. Um, it's a huge festival. And it's well, uh, I mean, every, it's well worth the, the trip over there and to play it. I mean, it's one of the greatest festival experiences of the summer. <clears throat> Incredible. Hey, um, what else? Yeah, I mean. So that's next year, June 2022. This year, things right. are still yeah, cold. So, so, so any tour plans? Like, how are things starting to ramp up for Hatebreed as far as playing shows again? Um, well, right now. You know, everything we had and then COVID hit, we had a lot of stuff lined up for world touring with Parkway Drive. And it was all announced. Uh, we were going to do the, the U.S., we were going to do Australia, we were going to do Europe. And then it got postponed and then it's gotten postponed yeah. again and shifted around. So uh, right now, some of it is kind of just, I don't know where it's at with that. For State next, of flux. For next year. It's in the flux. It's in the matrix. Yeah. So uh, nothing is really happening. I mean, we do have a couple things potentially for later this year, but nothing set in stone. Uh, you never know if it's going to go through. There's a, a lot of bands are jockeying right now, trying to do this or that and, and get it going again. So yeah, um, we're probably looking to next year right now. Solid. I know we're, we're already putting uh, festival plans together and, and whatever. So next year, for sure this year, I don't know. Wait and see. So I guess, I mean, this was the record that you were going to go out on and, and sort of like the legs got, you know, taken out from under it. I mean, that must be pretty weird. I mean, the cycle kind of got, you know, got stopped, you know? Yeah, yeah. We were, well, we were actually like we were out with Dropkick Murphys at the end of 2019 and we got back in October. And a month later, we were in the studio and starting to do this record. So it was actually recorded. Uh, recording started then and it was finished by January of 2020. Right. So this that's is what Jamie said. Yeah. Pre COVID. So we were, we were ready to go, man. We had all the plans in place to tour and all the plans in place for the initial rollout of the record and everything. And it just got all stomped on. So um, we did end up releasing it in November of last year. Yeah. I remember um, that. And it, it, you know, the initial reception was great. Everyone loves the tunes, but there's only so much you can do when you're not going out and supporting it and uh, you know, touring behind it. So well, speak, speaking of which, I know. So when you're not touring and not in the studio, you have another side project up there in upstate New York called the Albino uh, Albino Love Slaves, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> tell us. Tell us. I know yeah. you guys seem to have a real fun time uh, doing this little gig. It's a three piece. T tell us about it. Yeah, three piece band made up of myself and two other local cats from around here: Todd Myhan and Mike Hamill. Mike's the bass player, singer. Todd's a guitar player. They've been around here. Uh, we all came up together, man. They've been around 20 something years. I've known these guys. They're doing their thing. I'm doing my thing. Everyone's around. They give lessons. Um, they have their own solo things that they do in the area. Um, but we, uh, how it hooked, I jammed with Todd and uh, we had an opportunity. This is kind of condensed. There was other things going on, but uh -huh. we had an opportunity uh, to open for Tiffany at the chance. I think we're alone now. Yeah. That Tiffany? Yeah. Tiffany from the 80s. I mean, I who doesn't think remember? Any, I think we're alone. <laughs> I mean, word is that word is though that Tiffany is is super cool though. I've always heard good things about Tiffany. I've heard great things. We ended up we were supposed to, you know, meet up and uh, hang, meet each other, uh, whatever. Like all she was hanging out. All the uh, bands on the bill were supposed to hang. And we, uh it didn't end up with, it didn't end up happening that night. I forget what happened. We just got went off the other direction, but uh yeah, so so they needed a band, you know, Frank 
at the chance and Nikki, I've known them forever from being around here. Yeah. And they reached out like, Hey, you know, can you want to do this? Or it was either that, or I reached out to them and said, I want to do this. And I got the guys that are going to do it. And we're putting yeah. this band together. And that was the first show we did. And it ended up being awesome. Just a three piece band. We, we It's all covers. It's all covers. And the way we describe it is like, it's uh, funky, abstract rock and roll, you know, like we do some Stevie wonder. We do motorhead. We do some En Vogue. We do Johnny Cash. That's we do cool. some Nine Inch Nails. We do Little Slayer thing. So, um, yeah. So we, we like to mix it up. The singer's great. Mike's great. Uh, he's got yeah. a real soulful voice. And uh, it's another avenue from for me personally, like being in a, in a heavy, crazy, loud, fast, hardcore band to kind of sit back and just throw down some sick backbeats and, you know, let these dudes do their thing. And they're good. They're great. So we actually have a show coming up. Uh, and uh, we do smaller shows, bars in the area or whatever. We do play the chance. Um, but we got a show coming up next Sunday here in Beacon, New York. It's a new place that opened up. It's called District Social. And uh, we'll be playing there 5 to 8, June 27th, next Sunday. Albino Love Slaves. Come check it out. Nice. That's that in lovely Beacon, New York. You know, Beacon, Great town. A lot going yeah, on in Beacon. Yo, there a lot of people up there now. Craig Satari's up that way. You yeah. know, there's, 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 there's a, a, lot, a lot of people uh, up that way. Hey, let me um, let me take my last break here, uh, do a little sponsor thing and a couple upcoming shows, and we'll come back and we'll take some questions from around the world, okay? Shout out to Organic Grill. Vlad, love it. That jackfruit <laughs> sandwich, man. Yo, I know. Oh. We got this. You see this thing we have? We got – wait, hold on. Now, now, you, now, now you're – we got this thing coming up. Where is it? Where is this? So, you know, it, it, it all, it all ties in, right? It's like, uh, talking about Craig Satari and, uh, you know, organic grill. Where the hell is that? Oh, here it is. I'm sorry. Craig Satari, we're doing a hardcore brunch. You know, Vlad got on me about let's do a brunch and this yeah. and that, and we'll have a, a guest to honor. And I'm like, who? And then we're like, all right, we'll reach out to Craig and Craig was into it. So, this this Saturday is is the hardcore brunch with the guest of honor Craig Satari. So you know, and, and Vlad, it's like it's going to be a lot of food, man. Glad uh, Vlad puts out a lot of food, so he knows that's how, how to do it. Yeah. So if anybody out there, it's open to everybody. So buy a ticket, come on down. I'll talk to you in a couple minutes, Matt. All right, what's happening? It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles live. We're sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill. Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Chacho's Tacos, Generation Records, and, of course, the Texas Silver Rush. Russ. The Texas Silver Rush is a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. They specialize in working with musicians in all music genres to design and create unique one-off pieces as well as to style them for stage, album covers, promo photos, and social media exposure. Their client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famers Greg Rollet, Ringo Starr, and of course, Agnostic Front. During this current pandemic, all information and online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram pages, and of course, www.thetexassilverrush.com. Want to mention a couple other things, uh, something a little self-serving, uh, Saturday, July 10th. As music is opening up, we are getting out there and playing. If you're in New York City, come see Antidote NY8C play. We got a show at the Kingsland on Saturday, June 10th with Urban Waste, Crazy Eddie, the Car Bomb Parade, and reaching out fresh, all fresh off the A7 compilation that's, that's out now on Pitchfork. Come on down. Um, there's a pre-sale uh, ticket link. It's out there. Come check it out. And then one week later, everyone is very excited about this. We're getting back into our beloved A7 with Rampage Mosh Fest 2. How do you do? It is the Rampage Mosh Fest 2. Crippled Urn, Enziguri, Silence Equals Death, Necrotic Society, Diamond Dog, Serial Poets. DJ, you know what? DJ Frank the Governor. Meanwhile, hey, you. Yes. Hey, you. Me what? What? How come you're not DJing this show, bro? Oh, you know, because I got to go record. You got to go record what? 
United Blood in New York City. That's what I got to record. You know what, man? I think the priorities are screwed up. No, Drew. Truth be told, I locked this date two months before you locked this date in. So, hey. Woo! Priorities, homeboy. Priorities. Don't be a rock star, dude, all right? Hey, unlike some people on the show, I don't have the ego, and you and everybody else knows that. Woo-wee! There you go. DJ Sid the Kid with no ego. DJ No Ego. DJ No Ego can't make it to the A7 Rampage Mosh Fest Sunday, July 18th, but we're hoping you can. Uh, DJ the Governor, here we go. Frankie Too Far is going to be DJing. More to be announced. So come on down to the A7. We're doing shows. We're doing shows again. That said, I think I covered everything. Uh, Oi, there, you know what? I know there's people out there seeing how can I get the New York hardcore mug, shower curtain, stuff like that. There is a merch link underneath. Uh, also, the do good things and good things will come to you line. A couple of antidote NYHC things. Uh, there's merch. Buy some merch. Also, we do the uh, super chat. Um, costs a couple bucks, whatever it is. It catches my eye. It's color. If you have... A question from Matt Byrne from Hatebreed, and you want to come to the front of the line, please don't be shy. Do a little super chat. It's sometimes things get lost, but when they come up in color like that, I, I can't miss them. So that said, um, let's take some questions for our friend Matt Byrne. There you go. Let's see. Let's see. Come on. Yeah, get see. going. Get going, you people. Um, I am beyond psyched. I could talk okay. about uh, another thing Hatebreed's got going on, if that's cool. Please. Please do. So we've been working on a beer. Oh, wait, wait. Is it, would it be this? Hold on. I, I think, would it be this? That? Oh, that. I got it right here. <laughs> <laughs> that's fucking funny, bro. Quick on the draw. Yeah, we can talk about that. That is freaking that, funny. That's been a fun thing. This is... Uh, this has been something that we've done through this pandemic to keep us busy. And it's something we've talked about for a while. So we were able to bring it to fruition. And uh -huh. this is a, a lager that we did with this brewery uh, called Witch Doctor Brewing in Southington, Connecticut. Uh huh. They're right off 84. If you feel like taking a road trip up there, not far off, but uh, great guys. And um, we have another beer that we're working on. It will be coming out the end of July. So uh, the lager's cool. out. It's been out. Everybody loved it. We got a different version of this lager coming How out. How much alcohol vol volume is the question? This is a light one. This is a lager that's only four and a half percent. So it's not bad. It's not a, it's not a, you know, it, I, I always call it gig beer. That's how I describe it because you can drink it all night, all day and all night. And it doesn't blow your head off. I see. You know, with some of these heavier beers and, you know, the beer world's crazy, man. There's so much stuff going on. There's so many different uh, breweries out there now and, so yeah. many different recipes and people are doing all this cool stuff. Since we were talking about organic grill, I talked to Vlad some time ago about like he wanted to get a hold of it, start cooking with some of it. That <laughs> too. Oh, so we got uh, we have a new beer coming out. It'll be out the end of July, so keep a lookout for that, and uh, we'll be announcing that and showing the new label and all that stuff soon. And we have a non-alcoholic version of this one, the Live for This Lager, coming out as well. So trying to appease everyone. Uh, whether you're an alcohol drinker or not, it still tastes great. And uh, you get this awesome can. Collectors. Yeah. Mm. You know, you know, all you drummers with the beer, you know, Armand is a big beer connoisseur as well. Oh, Armand yeah. from Sick of It All Absolutely. is a big is a big beer connoisseur lover, yeah. you know? He's actually, you know, last year he road tripped up. He's not too far south of me, and he rode. Yeah, he, he's down in Tarrytown, which isn't that far yeah. from me. It's like probably forty minutes tops. Yeah, I think 40, 45. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we got yep. some breweries around this area, so we uh, we ventured out. And we hit like three. Had the wives with us, and and my friend Todd and his wife, and we ventured out. And we hit some breweries, and uh, it was great, man. It was That's great. awesome. He's, he's such a good dude. He's schooled. I mean, I get lost talking to him and talking to Dave Whitty from Municipal Waste. They're beer guys. Beer. Beer. I mean, deep, deep. Another fun fact, we're redoing our kitchen in this house. And, you know, when you open up walls and ceilings and stuff, you never know what you're going to find up there from previous construction guys hiding little Easter eggs. Right. So the walls were down. 
and I threw one of these cans in the wall for 30 to 50 years from now, someone That's else cool. is going to find this. And That's very cool. Have a nice what was the other, what was the other hate breed related uh, thing or, or was that it? That was it. Our beer. Yeah. We're, did, we will have, uh, we will have um, a new beer end of July and we will be doing a beer event in, in support of that. So come out and taste it and meet and greet and all that stuff. We're ramping up all the promotional stuff for that now. So keep your eyes peeled on all the hate breed socials and we'll be announcing that too. Two wow, I, One I nailed it. That's cool. Anyway. That's cool. Um, okay. Let's do some questions. Uh, Sound of one. What's a few bands hate breed hasn't played with that you'd like to play or tour with? That's hard to say. I think the big, the big whale, the big fish is Metallica. We've done some yeah. festivals with them and we'll be doing yeah. Hellfest with them, but to actually yeah. be on a proper Metallica tour, I yeah. think would be like the be all end all man, because they're the biggest metal band in the world, whether you like them or not. I mean, what, what era you like them, they've been around a long yeah. time. Uh, we got to tour with Slayer. We've toured with Napalm Death. We've toured with Exodus. We've toured with AF. We've toured with Chromax. Like we've, we've, pretty much toured with all the bands we would love to tour with at being fans. Mm -hmm. um, Metallica would be the big fish, I think. Sure. Sure. I'm sure a lot of bands would say that. <laughs> uh, Pepe says, Drew, ask Matt about all those great toys behind him. What's going on back there? So this is, uh, this is years of touring. Uh, those are all Spawn, McFarlane, Todd McFarlane. These are all his music line. He's done like that one right there is Janis Joplin or Jerry Garcia. That one's Jim Morrison. We got the Ozzy. Is that uh, right? He's, he did a Kiss line, and there's more That's cool ones over here. Got Metallica up here. Uh, Zeppelin is back here. Iron Maiden. Janis, there's Janis right there. That's uh, the cover of Master of Puppets right there. Yeah, so like over the years on tour, I just got – I fell into like collecting those – the music ones that he did as well as some of the movie ones ended up getting rid of the movie ones. I held on to like Texas chainsaw massacre or whatever <laughs> because he's the cool ones. Uh, but I always held the music onto the music ones. And here I'm in my basement here, you know, it's old school wood paneling walls and it's like grandma's old basement from the seventies. Um, but I made it into my jam spot. This is like my man room. I got all my gear down here. I got my drums in the back there. Yeah. Wow. That's a pretty set. That's brand new. Hasn't seen the road yet, so it doesn't wow, have any scars or anything on it. That is nice, man. So this will be like the that, one I'm going out with. Like that color, man. So yeah, it's like this is my spot down here. So all those toys come from years of touring in, in different cities, like hitting a Spencer's or a Hot Topic or something, or somebody comes and brings me them or something, you know. Um, question from question from upstate, Rick. Did you go to John Jay High School? Yes, I did. Whoa. Absolutely. John Jay High School, Hopewell Junction. John Jay High School represent, yo. <laughs> yo, yo, Rick knows what's up. Yeah, upstate, Rick, upstate Rick knows, man. Um, <laughs> here's, what did I see about, yeah, it came up a few times. Favorite hardcore drum intro. Would that be a, a hate breed or, or in general? I don't know. Favorite, uh, let, let, let's favorite favorite hate breed drum intro how's that I'll, hate yeah. breed drum intro well yeah there's uh the newest one i think you know you always become partial to your newer material because it's so sure. fresh, right so on the new record we have a song called the herd will scatter and the song basically just starts out with a drum solo um so i was able to stretch my legs a little bit show some chops um, I saw a clip of you doing that on, there's like a clip of you breaking that down on YouTube, I think. Yeah. For that yeah, song, I right? I saw that. Yeah. I did a playthrough on Instagram um, yep. where I played the whole song, but I did the whole intro and everything like that. So that's, uh, that's probably at the top of my list right now, but a song like Tear It Down off a of Rise of Brutality, that's our intro song, first song for that record. Starts out with a cool drum thing that uh, was actually, the idea came up when we were recording Perseverance would do a little nod to the bad brains where we end one record with a drum thing and the next record will start with that into oh, that's cool. the lead track. So tear it down was that, uh, that's a favorite, you know, I, I love playing that live, just a noodly little thing that I came up with on the spot. And here we are caught yeah. frozen in time forever. So, you, you know, this is a question kind of like for me, like going out there, have you uh, like drum tech wise, have, have you, do you uh, like 
um, are you still with the same guy? Do do guys cir- like like how does that work for a guy like you? That like is there a favorite or you have a main dude or like how does that work? Well, we we tour so much that we've been lucky.